My name's Chris Hollier and this is an NGTC V8. Well, it was originally, but it's not really now. On and off, I've got unfortunately quite a short attention span, so therefore I've been doing other things and I go away and do other stuff and then come back to kit cars again. And I've tried doing classic cars and the constraints of just building something the same as it came out of the factory, I find a little bit dull. I want to use a bit more artistic license and create what I want, not what somebody made 30 years ago and just try and recreate it. So what was your first involvement with kit cars? Um, I think probably going to Stanley Kit Car Show in about oh, 80 blah, 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 something, very early 80s, um, and I ended up buying a Dutton kit car. Um, but the very first one I built was one of these, an NGTC V8, um, for a friend of mine who I still know now. And it was a fantastic car, it was great fun. But while we were building it, we could see there was other things that could be a bit better. And that's not a criticism of Nick Green's original designs. I think they're a cracking kit car, but there was just more I wanted to do and show a little bit more of my own personality in the car. So what happened to the Dutton? I used the Dutton as my works car for about four years, and it was a very early Sierra pickup <laughs> because it was the cheapest one that Dutton was selling at the time. And it had escort running gear, and it was just my daily beater. And I used it and used it and used it. And then ultimately the bonnet catches let go. The bonnet flew up at about 65 miles an hour, trashed the screen and the roof, um, and then made it a bit un uneconomical to repair. So I then managed to find a Dutton Rico shuttle in a scrapyard that somebody had half built and abandoned and transferred all my running gear into the Rico shuttle, which was a little bit more practical because it was an estate car rather than just a pickup truck. So the Dutton lived on. Yeah, they're quite rare those Ricos as well. They are very, yes. Um, I think stylistically one of his better attempts yeah because it actually had quite a cohesive look from front to back whereas the Sierra's always looked like an escort door stuck in the middle of a lumpy car the Ricos actually had a flow from them from front to back yeah. and so it was practical it wasn't fantastic but it was what it was for the price it was yeah so um, you, you also you've built cars for other people I've built many many cars I think I'm up to 130 now in the way of kits I've built um, some were just finish offs some were full builds um, some were start to finish top ends um, I think I'm the only person in the country that's built four Adams Roadsters so I don't think anybody else built that many out of all the total so yeah they were quite fun that's almost mass production or serious practice. It is, yes. <laughs> and learning all the things that you have to redo <laughs> to make them right. So it's a, this is going to run a 4.6 Rover V8. Um, and rather than using the standard inlet manifold and inlet planning for fuel injection, I wanted something that looked more like the original quad downdraft weather setup. Now I could have gone for GMB throttle bodies and the throttle bodies in the inlet manifold would have cost me three, four, five thousand pounds by the time they're in and running. These are a set of second-hand BMW V8 throttle bodies, which were 250 pounds off eBay. And then we're designing and making our own inlet manifolds. These are 3D printed at the moment in plastic, as is the thermostat housing. And ultimately, when we've got the design properly finalized, they'll be sand cast, and then we'll machine them out from sand cast. And then there's a filter housing that's gonna go on top of here as well. And these are three different designs of inlet RAM with different curvatures on the inside to try and get the best shape that we can for the induction. And what was the concept with this car? Because it was quite an interesting concept as well. Um, even though it's a uh, modern replica fiberglass body, I was trying to find out what would have happened or think what would have happened if Carroll Shelby hadn't been the success he was over in the States with the AC Ace that they put the small block Ford V8 in. Now AC's already had a good car which they knew would sell well but they had an old Ford Zodiac straight six iron engine in it, which they knew they needed to change. But just about the time that Shelby got involved with ACs, BRMs were doing the development work on the Rover V8 for Rovers to change it over from an American engine to a European engine, changing carburetors, changing injection systems, all this kind of thing. 
Now the Hercock brothers that run ACs were also very friendly with the people who ran BRMs and they all knew people that ran Holcomb Hall up on the North Norfolk coast and they very often used to go on game shoots together. So it wouldn't be a great leap of imagination to think that if they were talking over the course of a shoot that ACs needed an engine to replace the Ford straight six, BRMs had a lovely all aluminium V8 that they were just about getting into production for Rover, that ACs would have said it's the perfect engine. It's a nice lightweight aluminium V8. We can make an AC V8. Which if you look at the registration number, AC V8 3.5. That's what it, it's not actually the genuine registration for the car, it's just one I've put on there. And it would have been their version of what became the Cobra. And it would have carried on having a, a European sports car without the bling that the Americans like so much. So it would have been more understated, it would have been more for touring rather than racing. So I'm going for a very steeply inclined screen and fixed side windows, probably not a roof, even though ultimately it might get one. I won't do one at the moment. Um, very understated rather than blingy with side pipes and chrome bumpers and 9 litre V8s and everything else that goes with it. One very important question regarding this car. Are you going to invite me back? Oh, absolutely. Um, hopefully, if it drives as well as I hope it's going to drive, I can come up to you. That sounds perfect. Some great roads in North Wales to yes, film it. so I understand. But I want a car that I can comfortably sit on a motorway at 80 miles an hour doing 30 miles to the gallon. And by using the fuel injection, by using the Rover engine, by using this suspension and this body, I should be able to achieve that goal. And for me, it's, I'd like to consider its end use before I start building the car. Because then I know what I'm building towards. It's never just about the look. Oh, it wants to be flashy or it wants to look faster. I need it to know what it's going to do. And then I can build the car to do that. So, from the conversation so far, I can see where we're going with, the, with, with this NG. Mm -hmm. So, tell me about, from, from did you, were you looking for an NG? Uh, how, how did you did, did this particular project Genesis begin? Uh, way back in the 80s when we built my very first one we knew there was quite a few things that could have been a bit better with it and myself and Laurie my friend we've been discussing it for years about how we could do this how we could improve that how we could make it a little bit more what we wanted from it um, and then about four years ago I was traveling through eBay like everybody does in the evening board and found this as an absolute derelict that had been half built in the 1980s and then stripped out and left in a scrapyard oh. and it was on eBay for £1,500 and at that kind of price I was I paid attention and I thought I'll just watch it I had no intention of buying one no intention of ever doing it I had plenty of customers work around and I put a bid on it just to get things rolling hoping it might help the seller out you know start the ball rolling but then it turned out four or five days later that I'd actually bought the thing so then it was uh, okay now I've got to find the money and go and get it and then rake through what's left of it because it did look desperately poor and see what bits I could sell off or whether it was worth doing. Um, so I travelled up to Doncaster to go and get it and when I was there found out that the previous owner had actually fully reconditioned all the suspension but it had just been sitting out in a scrapyard for five or six years that's why it looked so awful and it was correctly registered as an NGTC V8 on the logbook so there was no IVA test involved so it looked like a project that was worthwhile doing. So I bought it back home again, stuck it in the long, long list of other cars and projects that needed doing, thinking, okay, I'll get round to that one day. How long ago was that? Um, this was in 2018. Right. Um, and then we got towards the end of 2019, and of course, the world changed at the beginning of 2020. And I got the Cobra, which you've just seen in the workshop, which was underway already, but then found out that the IVA tests were going to be delayed by probably a year to 18 months. So it seemed silly to build the Cobra and have a finished car sitting in the workshop that I couldn't do anything with for the next year. So the NG was duly dragged out the workshop and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and that's where the design process started. Right, so you had a list of things that you wanted to improve on the original NG and are there some things that have sort of evolved as well as the projects progressed? Um, most of it was in mind right from the beginning. Um, there's obviously details that have changed, but the majority of the things that we wanted to do, um, the first one is because of the size of me. 
I'm six foot two, 18 stone. I don't fit in little kit cars. I need something bigger. So the first thing I knew I had to do was to make the cockpit bigger. So um, the first thing we did was chop the back edge of the cockpit away and move it back by four inches so the seat could go further back. Um, we also realised that on the original NG, because the bonnet is made of aluminium with a piano hinge down the middle, and it's very flat, when you drive over bumpy roads, they bounce up and down all over the place. And it's also about an eighth of an inch away from the top of the air filter. So we knew we had to make the scuttle and bonnet higher, which also gave me the advantage out of making more room for my legs underneath the dashboard. We also realised another one, quite a big one, is that the TC is in good shape if you want to go touring, but then you can't get to the luggage space properly. So we thought, okay, let's chop the bonnet, ch chop the boot out and actually make an opening boot lid. Right, so one of the lovely parts about the NGTC design was this boat tail. It's a great shape and it actually gives you quite a lot of volume in the back of the car. But on the original one, the only way to get into it was to tilt the seats forward and reach in from the back, which means you can get in to about here and all that's wasted space at the back. Because I wanted to do some touring in this, I knew I wanted to open the boot lid up. I'm not the first person to have done this, others have done the same. But the big advantage, if I open it up and show you, is that now you have enough room for lots of soft bags. You can stuff huge amounts in there. The battery is in the back corner in there along with an isolator switch i always insist on putting an isolator switch on a kit car yeah. because wiring is where always been their shortcoming and i love to be able to just isolate the entire electrical system in one go and always on the earth side not yeah. on the positive side and just in front of it i don't know if you can actually pick this up just here there's a little air valve and what i've actually done is fitted air shocks on the back of this so that when I'm empty, I can get a comfortable ride with just one person in without it being hard and crashing about everywhere. But then if I've got two people and a boot full of luggage, I can pump the air shocks up to about 80 or 90 PSI, raise the back end of the car by about two inches, and everything still rides nicely, but I don't get any tire scrub. Absolutely, yeah. So that, made, that was again another practical consideration when I was building it, because I knew it was gonna have both uses, either just me or you know, a lot more weight inside it. And then the last real big one was the engine fitment. When NGs went from the MGB engine, the 1800 four cylinder, up to the Rover V8, it was a tight squeeze in the engine bay. It was always going to be. Um, and their solution for the length of the thing was to make a radiator with a square hole in the middle of it so the cooling fan or the uh, water pump pulley could stick through the radiator. And when you put a three and a half litre V8 in a tiny little engine bay like that, cooling is always at the top of your priority list. So the last thing you want to do is lose a hundred millimetre square out the middle of the radiator because you've already got limited capacity. So by extending things and moving things around, we managed to create an extra eight inches inside the engine bay. And that allowed us then to fit a massive great aluminium radiator out of a 1932 Ford hot rod, which is designed to cool a 350 Chevy V8. So the cooling problems go away. And I've now used it on 85, 90 degree days sitting in traffic, and it will go up to about 85, 90 degrees. That's it, it doesn't go any further. There's lots of intricate detail as well. I mean, uh, from the, 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 the sill the sills you, you, you mentioned? Yes, when uh, on a standard NG, you can actually stand beside the car and you can see the side of the chassis rails. And I absolutely understand why they did it, because they wanted a monocoque fiberglass tub that they could lay on top of a fairly flat section chassis and just bolt it down. And it did the job and it formed quite a structural part of the chassis. But when you look at it from a distance and you look at other 1930s cars, you'll see that that was never done like that. They were far more refined, far more delicate. So the um, aluminium dimpled covers that run right away from the front to the back of the car are designed to disguise the side of the chassis rails and also give something for the bottom of the bonnet sides to close onto. Otherwise they just hang in free space. Um, and the advantage that gave me then was to be able to make the bonnet sides removable very easily because I had somewhere at the bottom to put alignment pegs. And with that and two shoot bolts at the top, I can lift them off in seconds and get really good access to the engine. Right, so just while I'm putting the bonnet sides back on again, the colour is actually a really cheap RAL colour called Distant Blue. And whereas most two-pack paint is 70, 80, 90 pounds a litre now, this is 18 pounds a litre. And that really appealed to my sense of meanness. It means I've got enough paint left over to paint the whole car again two or three times if I like, for half the budget most people spend on a paint job. It 
was all painted here in the workshop. Um, there's no clear coat or anything over the top, this is just a straight out the spray gun and then flat and polish afterwards. Uh, pop these back on again. Even though the V8's a tight squeeze in the engine bay, working on it's really easy because the bonnet sides are removable. Yes, very neat. Well, they don't fit, they won't, they're no good for anything, but it's a 1930s style car. They always had spare spark plugs, so I had to do it. Where do you spare fuses? That's the other thing uh, I always have. <laughs> well, the electrics again, because I've seen so many horror stories with kit yeah. car electrics, they're hidden as far as I can get it up underneath the dash. But still, when you kneel down next to the passenger door, you can see everything. It's all laid out, the fuse boxes are the most part, so changing fuses is actually really strong. And you've got a spare stasher in my chair. Not needed any yet. <laughs> Touch wood. And uh, you've also used it to protect the uh, the uh, brake lines and the, the wire loom as well. Absolutely. The I Part of my past has been interest in hot rodding. And when you look in any hot rod engine bay, there are no wires. It's, everything is clean and simplicity. And I really like that. It shows that you've paid attention to detail. And sadly, when you look in a lot of kit car engine bays, that's not the case. There are wires traped everywhere. Uh, and most of them are red, so there's no colour coding. And if you want to work on that afterwards, it becomes a real problem. Because my life has been building cars and building kit cars, I have to fix those problems when somebody else has made them. So I didn't want the same thing for me. I wanted a car which I could actually work on easily. Everything was traceable. There's decent wiring diagrams. And it looks neat because people are going to judge me because this is now my car rather than the customer's car, people are going to look at this one and say, well, okay, how much did you learn over 40 years? Okay, so tell me about the grill and the badges. Right, so the grill is a cast aluminium replica of the original NG shape. And about 20 years ago, I built an NG TCV8 for a customer, and he was very insistent he didn't want the original fiberglass grill. So I took um, an original one, modified original, over to East Coast Casting in Watton, and they made three for me. One was for the customer's car, one was eventually sold on many, many moons ago, and I had one left kicking around the garage, which is this one. And when the NG project came along, I knew it had to go on there. Now, the bit I really wanted to make different was the badges on the front. Now, you'll see the pair of wings with the H here and the V8 above and below the crossbar. This started off as a pencil sketch, which I gave to my son, who's an absolute whiz with computers, who turned it into a CAD drawing. We then sent the CAD drawing to a, a chap on the internet who does 3D printing in plastic. And he printed that out as a plastic original. We then took the plastic original again back to East Coast Casting only about 18 months ago. And they cast the badges in phosphor bronze for me so that they are absolutely unique. And then the blue section you can see is some candy apple blue two-pack paint just floated in. It looks like enamel, but it's just ordinary two-pack paint floating in a left to set. I just got a bit closer to that. So it's a, it, to me, it's now known as a Hollier V8, yeah. even though on the logbook it's an NGTC. And and the uh, the the cap on the top is that a? a That's just a chunk of aluminium that was sitting around in the workshop, which I turned, and I've got a lovely little knurling tool. Yeah, I was going to say it's beautifully knurled on yeah, so the edges. That's the easy part. Yeah. yeah. Getting the radius right on the top corner and getting a nice smooth top finish. That was the tricky part. Um, and I needed that shape to follow through the centre of the dash, a centre of the bonnet hinge through to where the windscreen starts and you'll yes. see that the bottom of the centre windscreen post is flared in to the back of the bonnet hinge. Tell us about so that, that windscreen because that is one thing I forgot to mention and, and those, I love the way that the individual wipers are part of the screen. Okay well the screen is all literally handmade from flat pieces of sheet. 
Um, the side right, the two side pillars and the centre pillar are 15 mil thick alley, and then the screen, the actual glass surrounds are four mil thick aluminium, and it's literally cut out with a bandsaw and then sanded with a grinder and then polished and shaped and polished and shaped. So there's about five weeks work just in the windscreen. It looks worth it though. It's and beautiful. If, if we walk around the side of the car, you were saying about the windscreen wipers. Yeah. To try and get these two to work at this angle and fit all underneath the dashboard was actually really difficult. Yeah, but to comply with mechanism goes into the dashboard right. there. So what it actually does is they're manual. Oh. So this knob on the dashboard and as far as the MOT consist, test was concerned, they're perfectly legitimate. Yeah, they work. Yeah, and they work quite mm -hmm. nicely. And I've actually used it in the rain and they work really well. Do you want to do that again, just so I can get that? That's brilliant. And then um, on this shaft, because the shaft doesn't line up with the knob, they're little M5 rose joints yeah. off of radio control car drive shafts. <laughs> um, so it was um, a very low key or a, a low tech solution. And the windscreen washers are a laboratory wash down bottle with a little curved, little curved pipe on the top. Okay, I've got to ask what this is. Okay. The interior lights? It's a map light, yes. <laughs> An original 1930s style touring map light. And then this, which was the original ashtray off the Riley, yeah. has now been converted and it's got two USB ports inside it. Oh, brilliant! So that now if I want to run the sat nav or charge my phone, I've got somewhere inside that I can use oh. it. Right, so the map light, yeah. even though I knew I wanted some kind of interior light, it's just practical because I intend to do a lot of touring with it. I did my apprenticeship, would you believe, with the Metropolitan Police as a motor engineer. And part of the job for the, all the apprentices was fitting out all the surveillance vans and then de-equipping them when they came out of service. All the surveillance vans had that map light in the back. <laughs> so I ended up at the end of my career with the Met Police when I finished my apprenticeship with two or three of those rescued from the bin. Oh, and this was from 1978, 79. Yeah. And I've kept it ever since. And when I was researching again the parts I had, everybody has piles of parts that build cars. Um, that came to light and I thought no that's got to go in there because it's part of my history and it also works and it's very practical and the instruments are absolutely gorgeous you mentioned them they are absolutely stunning aren't they uh, and this um, hand cut section underneath here again is to replicate the badges on the front yeah with the wing cuts on the bottom of it yeah and it gives you a nice background and again it's adding relief to the yeah. kit car plank is this is this oak this is oak it yes like, oh, this is a piece of oak veneered ply so it's still a plank yeah but it's a plank with some style yeah and then the ignition switch and light switch are fairly standard 1950s english fare that the light switch is around the outside of the ignition switch and what looks like the screen wash push on the far side yeah. is actually the dip switch so you don't have to have a dip switch because with narrow foot wells on these cars there isn't room for a foot operated dip switch yeah you always have to put it somewhere else so it was easier to put it there oh, right. Brilliant. Tell me about the engine as well. Uh, very interesting one. Um, it's a bit of a nerdy one, but it is interesting. When I first got the car, the engine and gearbox were sitting on a pallet in bits next to it. And I didn't recognise the gearbox. I knew it was a Rover V8, I could see that straight away. But the gearbox I just didn't recognise. And I came home and started researching and researching and found out it was actually an MGB gearbox that somebody had mated the Rover engine onto. But the unusual part is, on the Rover block, when you try to mount them on the engine stand, they're usually attached with four arms, two at the top, two at the bottom. And on one side, somebody had cut a great big chunk of the engine block out of the way, which was very strange. But it had been done really neatly. And then the adapter plate to bolt the gearbox on the back of the engine was again very professionally made. And after looking and looking and looking at good old internet, I found out it's actually a Ken Costello MGB V8 conversion kit before British Leyland even made an MGB V8. He did all the development work and then Rover took it on afterwards. And it's one of his original Costello engine conversion kits. 
So originally I was just going to dump the engine because it had been sitting outside for so many years. But when I found that, I thought, no, I've got to save this one. And even though it's a rope seal engine, which are an absolute sod to get oil tight, it was worth it. It was worth persevering with because it adds an awful lot to the character of the car. Another thing that I noticed as a trimmer was the interior. Beautiful. Yeah. Do you want to talk me through that? Um, and the plank. Right, the kit car plank. Yeah. Let's start with the interior first. Um, I knew I needed space. I can't use the standard NG setup, which was um, Corbo or similar bucket seats on adjustable runners, because it puts me too high inside the car. Um, and I also find them too narrow, because I've got yeah, a sizable derriere, shall we say. So the option was to actually use the seats of something else. And, and all production car seats end up too wide for the interior of the NG. But that's only the seat frame. So what I managed to find was a pair of NG, MG TF seats. And I took the foam off the top of the frame and then made a flat board for the backrest because I wanted a fixed bulkhead behind the seats. And then I made two baseboards for the seat bases. Then went on eBay and found two second-hand sofas, settees, um, in leather for 150 quid. And then I had enough leather to do the entire inside of the car for 150 quid. And it had a nice age to it as well. New leather, yeah, it would have looked nice, but it just wouldn't have suited what I really wanted in there. So by chopping the MG TF seat foams around and making them the right width, right size, right depth, and then covering them and using the original MG TF covers as patterns for the leather, I managed to stitch up an interior that fits, is comfortable, which is nice, um, and didn't cost the earth. And there was enough leather left over to do kick panels, door panels, bits of trim, anything else I wanted. And the dash. And the dash. That is beautiful. The kit car plank. Yeah. Um, I've been going to kit car shows for you know, 40 years, 30 years, whatever. Um, and I see so many people making a tremendous effort on the outside of the cars. They look fantastic. Then you look inside and there's a piece of plywood with holes cut in it and some old MGB gauges stuffed in. And I'm sorry, if you look at any 1930s car, they had style. If nothing else, even though they might have been difficult to drive, they had style. So you need depth and relief on the dash panel, and you need some features to give it some shape, not just this flat plank. So it was a, this was a critical area of the car design for me that had to look right. Um, by modifying the scuttle as I have to move it up, to put more curvature in it, it allowed me to move the whole dashboard up away from my knees, which has given me a lot more room to play with. Um, the instruments that are in it are most of the remains of a 1952 Riley RMA dashboard. And I've had, and it's a beautiful car. Um, and the, even though the shapes aren't quite the same, the inspiration is definitely from the Riley dashboard with the two raised panels either side to give it some interest. And I've had all the dials recalibrated apart from the Speedo, which yeah, how fast you're going. I've got a sat nav for that. But at least everything else, the fuel gauge reads correctly now, oil pressure, water temperature are all absolutely bang on. All the switch gear works. Um, and again, the luxury of having a previously registered car. I didn't have to worry about IVA constraints on switches and light positions and everything yeah. else. It gave me proper freedom. So even though a lot of people will criticize a Q registration, oh, it's just a kit car, oh, da, 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 it gives me complete freedom to do what I want. I don't devalue a car because of it has got a Q plate on it. I'm looking yeah. at the workmanship, not the registration number. Yeah. 